Every year, we hear in the news about horrible wildfires that are spreading across landscapes, destroying everything in their path. Wildlife perishes, homes are burned, and human lives are lost. A series of explosive new wildfires. Very rapid fire growth and very, very explosive fire behavior. You could see the hills glowing. The facility was on fire. They kept repeating there was no time to get out. There was nothing we could save. Throughout this tragedy, some people are losing loved ones twice. Families that have urns filled with precious cremains often don't have time when evacuating a rapidly approaching fire to rescue the urn, and so those urns of ashes are lost in the devastation. Here's a question. Can dogs recognise the scent of a person even after they've been cremated? And can a dog find those ashes in areas devastated by a wildfire. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to as you walk your dogs. In this episode, we'll hear from a dedicated team who found a way to provide some solace to victims of wildfires by harnessing the power of dogs' noses. We certainly will, and we'll also hear from someone who's had their father's ashes returned to them after a wildfire destroyed their home. And we share a story that seems to indicate that a dog can recognize our personal scent even after we've been cremated. That and more on today's episode. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's go for a walk, because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey Pepper, wanna go for a walk? Wildfires are devastating in so many ways. When you have a wildfire coming at you, you better get out of there really quick because the flames are spreading so quickly. Get out, go to safety. And it's not easy in that circumstance Mm -mm. to think of what those things are that are incredibly valuable and personal to you that you want to grab. Yeah, things like photo albums or antiques or cherished heirlooms. But what happens when you leave behind an urn filled with cremains of a loved one. Now, I have to say that if I was in the situation of evacuating a house, I wouldn't necessarily think of grabbing the cremated remains of a relative because I would perhaps naively think that nothing was going to come to that ashes that hadn't already happened to it. You know, they are already cremated. They're going to be in a wildfire. Nothing's Mm -hmm. going to change. But from my understanding... What happens is that the urn itself can disintegrate and then the ashes become part of the devastation of the burnt house. That's right. And finding those ashes within the ashes of a burned building is almost impossible. Or is it? We found a volunteer organisation that uses, you guessed it, dogs to find these ashes within ashes. Makes you wonder, is there anything a dog can't do? I do think their noses are incredibly powerful. How did all of this get started? So I've never heard about them doing this particular thing of finding ashes after a wildfire. Is it a new thing? Well, that's because it has never been done before. And it all started with the Tubbs fire in California in 2017. So we had uh, this massive wildfire, the Tubbs fire, that came through, ignited at night traveled about 20 miles in a couple hours and burned down about 8,000 buildings that evening. Big portion of our town went up in flames that night. And it was a real shock to everyone. No one thought this was even possible, you know, that that a wildfire could take out a a city. That is Alex DeGiorgi. He is the principal investigator at Alta Archaeological Consulting. Unfortunately, one of Alex's co-workers had lost his home in the fire And in the chaos of evacuation, his father's ashes were left behind. He asked Alex, is there anything that you could do to help? He was really distraught, you know, having gone through this traumatic event and having lost his parents' ashes and not having this chance to follow through with what their wishes were. So he asked, you know, knowing that I'm an archaeologist, is there something that I can do? And I linked him up with the Institute for Canine Forensics. They're the doggy teams. Their dogs are specifically trained 
on detecting human cremains. The Institute for Canine Forensics is just as cool as it sounds. <laughs> they specialise in locating prehistoric remains like ancestral burial grounds and historic cemeteries. They have even worked with the National Geographic to locate the remains of Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart? Yes. There is an amazing National Geographic article about it, which we'll share a link to in the show notes. They're pretty sure that they found her burial site, but they have no way to test. It's an amazing story. The whole Amelia Earhart thing is an amazing story. And they've used highly trained and certified dogs and dog handlers like Lynn Engelbert and her border collie, Piper. Lynn and Piper met with Alex and his friend early on a Sunday morning to see if they could do the impossible. We went to Lynn's house, which was literally eight inches of ash, just ash eight inches deep, that the fire was so hot and burned so completely. And so he had a rough area where he you know, thought his mom and dad might be. And uh, so I got Piper out of the car and told her to go to work. And within two minutes, she had alerted on an area. So I went in and started brushing fluffy ash off. And I said, you know, what else was on the shelf? And his wife said, both of our mother's good china was on the shelf. Well, there was two sets of good china branched and all broken. So we started removing that and brushing a little bit more ash away. And then I saw the cremated remains laying there on the ground. I was not prepared. I mean, you you walk up and here's a man who is totally devastated because when they come to clear the debris of his home, it's all going to go to a toxic dump. And the thought of his mom and dad's ashes not being scattered where they wanted to be scattered together But in a toxic dump, he was devastated. And when their son drove up, his wife hollered, they found grandma and grandpa. And the joy in her voice was palpable. That is an incredibly moving story. The fact that they were able to find those ashes and did so within two minutes. And Lynn had seen Piper in action before, but apparently Alex was pretty skeptical. Even after the dog had made that alert signal that it does when it finds what it's supposed to find. Alex comes over because he's an archaeologist and this is what they do. He got down on his knees and he's picking up and he's going through this and he goes, oh my God, there's a tooth fragment. There's a piece of bone. And he told me later, he said, I thought this was all smoke and mirrors. I didn't think that dogs could find this and now i know they can that's amazing and after his first successful recovery they suddenly realized that wow this could be a revolutionary application of archaeology and canine forensics when we realized hey you know this might not be an isolated event and so we founded a non-profit alta heritage foundation which is specifically geared towards helping folks after wildfires and working with canine teams. And since then, we've been in 18 national disaster wildfire areas and excavated over 300 homes. I'm amazed that 300 homes would need this service. Is this a cultural thing, Jim? You know, coming at this as a Brit, I don't know anybody who keeps the ashes of their loved ones in their house. Do you know anyone as an American? I do. I know someone intimately, myself. Um, I I have a, a little sacred Buddha cabinet where I have cremains of both family members and four-legged family members. I think it's increasingly common these days, at least here in the States, maybe not so much in the UK. A lot of the people in this story that we're hearing from, they had the remains of loved ones because their loved ones had had very specific requests about how their ashes should be scattered. Mm. Do you mind if I ask, is that the case for you? Is there something, is there like a bigger plan or are you keeping those ashes close to you because you want to keep them there indefinitely? I do have a bigger plan, but I think there's also, I think this is fertile ground for a psychologist, but I think there is like a resistance a little bit to like getting rid of those ashes there's been a lot of death in the last few years that we've all experienced and i just went to an ash scattering 
for my Hanai mom. And that was a beautiful thing here in, in Maui. But Molly and I have certain plans for our family of dogs, and we are going to do that. So yeah, I think it's a temporary thing, but uh, that's where they are right now. Yeah, and that's so common of all the stories that we're hearing, isn't it? And it would be devastating for you or for anybody if those plans that you had in mind were suddenly disrupted by a wildfire. And I can see that it's a really important part of the closure when you've lost somebody. And for these people who were finding the ashes within the ashes, when they started out, it must have been slightly trial and error. Alex says it was a lot of trial and error because they had never done this before. So we've had to really kind of innovate the methods over the course of doing this several hundred times. And we've gotten good at it at this point. I mean, at the beginning, we made lots of mistakes. And, and the sad thing about making a mistake in these situations is that you get one chance to find someone's daughter's ashes. And if you don't do your job right, you lose an opportunity to provide solace to this person. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. So what is this process? Where do they even begin trying to find the ashes? Well, I asked him. The recovery team gets together, which is all composed of volunteers. They don't get paid, and often some of these volunteers have to do it over the weekends outside of their normal work day. The first thing they do is they meet with the wildfire victim at the burn site, but it's not quite as simple as just driving up to a burn foundation. The thing you should understand about a wildfire, these wildfires that we're dealing with, it's not like a house fire where the fire department comes and puts out the house and there's a skeleton of a house standing there. These events are so massive that there may be a million acres burning at once and whole towns are being obliterated. And no one goes and puts out the fire for days. So these homes will burn for days and days. And you may have a two-story stucco building that is now reduced to four inches of ash and everything is gone. I mean, refrigerators are turned to dust. I've seen some of the images on news reports, but it must be surreal to actually be on the site. It's a completely apocalyptic landscape. It is. And when the recovery team is going out there, it's often the first time that the homeowner has seen their former home and they themselves are often in a state of trauma. I can't imagine how awful it must be because... There aren't even those usual landmarks to follow. There's no kind of turn mm -hmm. left at the tree that's at the start of their driveway. It's just all gone. The entire land is just scorched earth. And then once they get to their home, they have to put all of that grief and shock aside and work with the recovery team. Yeah, it really is an investigation. They ask who the person is that they're looking for, where in the house the urn was located, what kind of vessel they were in. Was it ceramic or metal or, or something like that? Because ceramic urns tend to survive fires as they've already gone through an intense heat process in their production. Once all these clues are gathered, they send in the dogs. Our dogs train on cremated remains because a lot of the native cultures that we work with practiced cremation and not inhumation. So wherever the dog chooses to alert. They're trained to alert on the strongest scent source. And if they can find a homogenous pocket of ash, then we collect that. So when Lynn says a homogenous pocket of ash, I'm kind of curious, what does she mean? Well, in the wreckage of the burned building, there is a, a mixture, a whole bunch of ash of all different kinds, bits of drywall and metal and stucco and furniture. And this creates this melange of different colors and textures. But with human ash that has been processed at a crematorium, it's more like a fine ash that is just one color. And before you ask, Claire, yeah, human ash can actually be different colors. It can range from a light gray to almost a salmon hue or tan. And it'll be, a, it'll, it'll be a loaf. I am not entirely sure I want to know that, but I can see how helpful it is to the investigators to find the ash and loaf. I don't really like that either. Yeah, well, you never know what you learn on Dog Edition. Once they have recovered the ash, however, they give it to the family. But sometimes, Lynn says, the recovery teams can't find the loaf whole like in areas where they've been disturbed or maybe the urn was on a second story of a house and fell during the burning of the building. 
we have a very high rate of recovery. But if they can't find a homogenous pocket of ash, we've learned to give the client where the dog's alerted. And the client is right there watching. So we tell them this is a memorial sample. Your loved one's essence is there. And we've not have it, had anybody be upset with that. So between the colour and the texture and the location, it sounds like they can be fairly certain that they have found the cremains they were looking for. Mm-hmm. But for something which, as we've discussed, is of such huge importance, is there anything else that they can do to make absolutely sure that the ashes the dogs alerted on are really the human that they were looking for? Well, there are a couple of things because most crematoriums, at least here in the United States, include an identification medallion, which is a small little metal disc that is stamped with an ID number that is identifiable to the individual. And that is either included in the cremains or on the urn. So every person that goes through the cremation process, they have this medallion. It's kept with them throughout the whole process. So if they find the medallion, then they know for sure. Exactly. And the second thing they can do is sometimes when they don't find that characteristic loaf and they're not totally sure, there is another test that they can do. Here's Alex to explain that. The dog alert will collect some of the ashes in a bag and take it off site. And then we'll run the dog past it. And if it alerts on the bag, once it's been taken away, some essence of that person is still in the bag. And usually that's enough for the family member to feel better about the situation. So I can imagine that there are other environmental factors that also affect how successful the dogs will be on their search as well, like weather, I guess. Well, Alex says that wind and heat can make it particularly difficult for dogs to do their jobs. He gave us two examples from the same dog that show just how much that can affect how these dogs detect odor. The woman had a keepsake urn. So what we were looking for was like less than a teacup of ashes, which to me, you know, from the outside, I said, hey, you know, this is an impossible. And it was a massive building we're in too, and she wasn't certain where the stuff was. So if the dog does its surge and gives a really hard alert and it lays down, puts its nose on the ashes and they look down and the you can see the ashes right where the dog's putting its nose. I'm like that was incredible. Absolutely a scare thing. Same dog on a different site. We were looking for some of those ashes and they were kept in the garage. And we walk up to this garage that's now just melted wreckage. And I can see the pile of ash laying there on the floor of the garage. I'm like, great. And it was a a really windy day. And it was just a flat surface. There was nothing to cool the scent. And the dog would run across the side, run right over the ashes, get downwind. And there'd be scent wafting through the air, being blown right downwind. It'd run downwind, hit a fence line and run the fence line. And it did this three or four times. This is like the worst situation for the dog to try to do its job. And it's actually picking up the scent and running it out over and over, but it's downwind. I mean, there are certain situations where they are going to be more successful than others. And this kind of proves that as amazing as the dogs are, it really is about the human dog teamwork, isn't it? It is. We're going to take a quick break right now, but after the break, we'll hear more from Lynn about how the dogs are trained to find the ashes And we will also hear from one lucky woman who had the ashes of her father returned to her through this process. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. (laughs) No matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life. And the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. 
Everpop is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpop Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. Welcome back to Dog Edition. So, Jim, we've been learning about the amazing capabilities of these dogs. But how on earth does one go about training a dog to find cremated remains? Because normally in similar things, they train them on animals stuff first. But this is specific to humans. They've got to use human remains. Well, let's go back to the Institute for Canine Forensics and see what Lynn has to say. Well, we start off using old bones, human bones that we get from osteological supply houses. These are the houses that supply for educational purposes, you know, everything from articulated human skeletons to different different types of bone. But so we get old human bone and these osteological supply houses know that we don't care what that bone looks like. So if they have broken bones or bones that are all corroded, uh, we don't care. We'll take those, and they give us a good sorry, a good discount on them because human bone is not is not cheap. Every day on Dog Edition is an education. That is not a sentence I ever thought I would actually hear <laughs> someone say. I know, right? Lynn says that she also gets teeth from oral surgeons. Of course, Lynn asks that they do not put those in any formula to clean them because teeth, and I didn't know this, have sense. In fact. It only takes 10 to 15 minutes in a room for a tooth scent to fill that room for one of these detection dogs. And if a tooth is over 100 years, 150 years old, the dogs are still able to sniff them out. So, Jim, after the show, can I get Lynn's address? Because I have some of the teeth I had extracted as a child, which my parents kindly passed on to me. And I have been looking for a way to get rid of them. And Lynn (laughs) is clearly the woman to pass them on to. (laughs) Clearly. So, Lynn has all these teeth and bone samples. And she uses them to train amazing dogs like Piper. But these aren't really burned bones and ashes, right? So how does she train them to find cremains if they're used to finding fresh teeth and bones? That is a great question. Here's Lynn. Human is human. And we've just discovered that our our set never seems to change. I'll tell you a little story. And this is a personal story because I believe that we not only maintain the human sound, but we maintain the individual specific scent. When my husband passed away in 2006, I was talking with the gentleman at the Varium service. When it came time to go pick up my husband's ashes, he said, bring your dog in. So my daughter and I and my dog went in. Daughter's sitting on one side of the room. I'm on the other side of the room. I'm holding my husband's ashes. All of a sudden, my dog leaps to his feet and starts to whimper. And he came running over to me And he started sniffing that box. And he would sit down and he'd whimper a little bit. And then he'd sniff the little creases on the folded brown paper that it was wrapped in. And he'd whimper again. And the gentleman from the creation service, he goes, oh my God, he knows who that is. That is a slightly spooky but amazing story. Mm, I know. So we've heard about how this incredible process works and how the dogs are trained, but we wanted to share with you a success story about a family that had lost their father's ashes in quite traumatic circumstances. But thanks to the recovery team, they were able to be reunited with them. Here is Molly Rich from Paradise, California. My dad had just passed away the previous July, We were going to have a military burial for him, but we couldn't because Reading was on fire, and that's where the cemetery was. So we postponed it, and then in November, my brother happened to be visiting my mom at the time, and she recalls opening the front door and looking out on a hill and seeing it just glowing. And we always said if paradise caught fire, 
Paradise and Megalia, it's a one way in, one way out, and it would be devastating. And she just remembers telling my brother, we got to get out. We got to get out now. And she went up, grabbed my dad's wedding ring and left. And I remember getting a call at work thinking, oh, mom, you're fine. She goes, no, I'm in the middle of a Save Mart parking lot. Everything's on fire. I'm like, I'm sure, I'm sure you're fine. And then all of a sudden it went dead. And then I researched what was going on. I just talked to my mom. I just lost the phone call. And this town is on fire. I didn't hear again from her for eight hours. I can't even imagine how terrifying that was. It must be absolutely terrifying. These fires move so quickly and destroy everything in their path. Mm -hmm. Molly's mother had been unable to get out of paradise on that one-way road. And instead, they found themselves corralled together with other families in the Safe Mart parking lot. Everything was like midnight black. Literally, she was surrounded by flames, by blowing propane tanks, power pulls, everything. Thankfully, those that took shelter in that parking lot made it out of the fire okay, but they were stuck there for hours while their homes and their neighbors' homes burned to the ground. Of course, they also had the risk of serious smoke inhalation from witnessing that. But when they did get to safety, I remember asking her, okay, mom, okay, I'm so glad you're safe. Did you get dad's ashes? And it went silent. And oh, I just, I just cried. <laughs> because being that it was a military memorial for him, it was very important for us not to leave a man behind and to not bury an empty box. Molly says she tried hard not to show her emotions because she was so glad that her mother and her brother and her mom's Labrador made it out safely. And obviously they were the most important things. And she didn't want to make her mum feel bad about not getting the ashes. I mean, I, I wasn't in that moment. You're panicking. You're like, I got to get out for safety. If you look at the documentaries, there were literally moms covering babies on the side of the road because they couldn't get through. They actually say her house burnt. Her whole life burnt in about eight minutes. That's how hot the fire was. She was so lucky to get where she was. I just internally, I just, I broke down after I got off the phone and I just thought, oh my gosh, that was the last thing of my dad. And I mean, I think it was hard because we literally had nothing physical left of him, nothing because of the fire. And that was the only thing that we really wanted. After that moment, I just went full bore and, and thought, what can we do? What do you do? Well, that's when they found the Alta Heritage Foundation. But by the time that the recovery team had met with Molly and her family to search for her father's ashes, it had been over two months since the fire. The recovery team had to wait so long because with all the houses, there was a serious asbestos risk. It had also rained, of course, in those two months, and they had all but lost hope. Mm. But of course, they had to try. I actually have video footage of Piper doing what he's supposed to do and circling where he's circling. And, I, and I'm and i whispering behind the camera saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, is he going to find it? Oh my gosh. And he was kind of circling where we kind of thought it would be. And all of a sudden he sat and I thought, oh my gosh, because there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee these dogs are going to find anything. The success rate is very good, but there's still no guarantee. So to go through all of this and then have it fail would have just been so devastating. I mean, I literally just prayed. I was like, oh my gosh, please, please, please. And so Piper sat and that's when we saw Lynn put like every team member on this house. And I remember her saying it was one of the more difficult houses because it was completely all stucco. And when Piper sat down and then the archaeologists came in and they were gathering the cremains and I thought, gosh, I still, I don't know. I found convinced. And then all of a sudden they found the cremation tag. And that was just, it was completely right there on top of the ashes. So that was all the proof I needed. I was like, oh my gosh, I have my dad. I have a little bit of house with him, but I have my dad. <laughs> so that's an amazing story. And mm. I love the way these people are telling this tale with such, you know, good hearted humor as well. 
And as someone who comes from a military background, your husband's in the military, that has certain resonance. Absolutely. I understand the importance of, you know, making sure that those ashes are interned in exactly the way that the person wished them to be with all the right ritual behind it as well. And because of the efforts of this amazing organisation, Molly and her family were able to hold that proper memorial for her father. And Lynn even went along. These teams are absolutely incredible. And not only are they all volunteer, but no one has ever paid for this service. And not only are they doing it free of charge, but they're also taking on those costs of getting to the search location site as well. And that can be really expensive. There's the hotel costs and the travel and the personal protection equipment that they need because often they're working in a toxic environment. We talked about the asbestos at one of the sites earlier on in this show. It is expensive. So if you would like to donate, volunteer, or request to help one of these recovery teams, you can go to their website. It's A-L-T-A-H-F dot org. And we have a link to that in the show notes, as well as on our website at dogedition.com. They are working to expand their reach outside of California to other geographic areas, but they need support to help make that happen. After all, what they are doing is really significant to the families that they serve. Here's Molly Rich. Like they cared. This is their gift to people. And you know, people probably think, oh, you know, that's great. But when you actually have a loss like that and you feel that loss and then you have somebody bring you hope, they were your angels at that moment. Well, that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us on your walk. If you'd like to hear more about the Alta Heritage Foundation, hop over to our show, The Long Leash, to hear the extended conversation between Jim and Alex. And I know we say it every episode, but it is so important. If you enjoy this show, then please follow along in your podcast app and tell a friend, one of your dog walking pals, if you enjoy this podcast, then let them know about it as well. I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. And I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.